Good afternoon, Compute community, community, and welcome back to Denver, Colorado. We're here at Supercomputing 2023. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined here by the ineffable John Furrier. John, what a fantastic time to be alive in computing. You know, the, the AI converges with semiconductors and cloud computes creating a perfect storm of innovation. Our next guest is going to break down some really innovative technology. Jonathan Ross is here, the co-founder and CEO of so Grok. Excited. He also is an inventor at Google on the tensor processing, which we covered in depth at Google Next, and everyone knows was a huge Casual. success, which he did on his spare time. Jonathan, great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for uh, coming on, really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, it's great to be here. So first of all, congratulations on the, t on the TPU project that really unearthed uh, the mission of Grok. Um, talk about the origination story of Grok. How did it start, and then what are you guys doing today in the market? Well, so Gronk started because when I was at Google and created the TPU, we realized even back then that there wasn't going to be enough compute for everyone, for AI. And we're seeing that now, today. And we wanted to make sure that everyone had access to the AI economy. So we started Grok in 2016, and we've invented what we call the LPU, Language Processing Unit, and it's really fast. What was that moment you wanted to uh, democratize it? Was there a particular time? What was the, what was the point where you said, you know what, I got to do this? Yeah, so it was when um, we played the world champion in Go at Google, so it was all DeepMind software. But about 30 days before the competition, there was a test game that was played, and Lee Sedol won. And 30 days before that, we ported to the TPU, and we won by a wide margin. We realized, oh, compute really matters. It's the difference between losing badly and winning badly, and we did not want some people to have this and, and some people not. Explain the LPU real quick, because you guys trademarked that, and there's been DPUs, data processing units, obviously, you know, TPU, tensor for TensorFlow, and then you got CPU. What is the LPU? What specifically is it? What does it do? So the best way to think about it is all of these other architectures you're hearing about are really good at parallel compute. Some of them are really good at sequential compute. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you can't produce the hundredth word until you've produced the 99th. Very much like a game of Go or chess, language is the same thing, it's just a larger space. And so we're very good at sequential problems. I, <laughs> that was a great analogy. I think uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say about this. So you, you know, democratization of AI, hot topic for us this week at the show, big time. You talked about the haves and have nots. Speaking of, did Elon steal your name? So, uh, so, um, did not steal, <laughs> but is trying to. Is he inspired by? I think he was heavily inspired <laughs> by us and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so. I mean, like I think, me to... well, I think it's great because, you know, imitation is the highest form of flattery. You were the Grok first. Now, we actually have a really exciting demo that shows off Grok. This is Grok versus Grok. Could you go ahead okay. and bring right. up this fun demo for us? So, um, famously, uh, when Elon Musk started Tesla, he gave Peter Thiel a, a ride. And right before slamming the accelerator down, he said, watch this. So, Elon. Um, Watch this, this is your model versus the real Grok. That is... Wait, it keeps going. Oh, oh wait, there's more. That sounded like another famous person in tech more, we know. More, I more, love that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is, I'm literally, I wish you could see my, <laughs> my arms right now. The, stare, the hair is standing up. I definitely have goosebumps. When you showed me just a second ago before we were live, first words out of my mouth, wow. And what yes. I loved is you said, wow is our brand. We're literally getting our business cards changed to say wow on them, and we're going to hand them over when people say wow. We've never done the demo and someone didn't say wow, except there are sometimes people use expletives and other words. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, there's some of that. For well, once I didn't, which is, which is rare for me. Okay. What's the speed? Where is it coming from? Is it because you guys got the chip? Is it the, uh, is it the language model? What specifically, what's the secret sauce? So it's purely the architecture and in particular the system. So rather than building a chip, we built a system. And we started with the software. So at the first six months at Grok, we worked on the compiler. We banned people wow. from designing the chip. We got rid of all the whiteboards in the office because people kept trying to draw pictures of chips. After about six months, we had a compiler working. But what we did was we built a factory. So normally, when you buy chips, you'll, you'll have one chip, eight chips or something working on a problem. But that's not very efficient. You, you wouldn't build a small factory, you'd build a big one. So the demo right. that, that's running on, that's 576 chips. And each one of the chips does a very small part of it and then hands it off to the next chip. So we're actually 10 times faster, 10 times cheaper, 
10 times lower power, and because we started with a compiler, we can often get software working 20 times faster, which is crazy. If I hadn't just shown you how fast it was, you shouldn't believe me, but that's real and we're ramping up our production. That, that's wild. I mean, that, that's an order of magnitude or more across a lot of different axes within a business. But there's a trade-off. Let's talk about it. The trade-off is it's a factory. Just like if you were building one car, you'd never build a factory. If you're going to compute something for one user or a small number of users, this makes no sense. If you're going to scale, this is the solution. So what types of customers are coming to ask you to help scale in this space? So um, a lot of finance, a lot of uh, government, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, tech companies, but actually interestingly, a lot of startups. And so the website that, that I showed you, that's actually running on our API. And we oh, sell awesome. tokens as a service, but we also sell the hardware, whatever people need. What does this mean for the GPU and what's the role of yeah. the CPU in this? Well, GPUs and CPUs are great. You should keep buying them. Uh, CPUs, we actually have some CPUs in that system. Uh, GPUs are what we're used to train that model. We're no better than a GPU at training. We're better at inference. And so you should continue buying GPUs and you should buy LPUs when you need inference performance. We were at the KubeCon conference last week and uh, one of the Google engineers, Tim Hopkin, Hopkins said, inference is the new web app. Um, what is the big deal about inference? A lot of people are now kind of looking at training and saying, okay, it's expensive, GPUs do it great. What's the big deal about inference? Why is it so important for people to get inference right or even consider having that a big part of the design? Well, um, training is a cost center. <laughs> you make money at inference. And training also isn't that large. It, it scales with the number of ML researchers you have, which no one has enough ML researchers. But inference scales with the number of users. And this always happened. This is why we built the TPU at Google originally. Yeah. They had trained a model. It was better than humans at speech to text. And we're like, mission accomplished. Oh, we can't put it in production. We would need to double or triple our global data center footprint. And that's just for speech recognition. If we want to do anything else, it's going to cost more. That's wild to visualize. Yeah, yeah it's All insane. All of Google when we're And that was just for this. one service. That's insane. What's this do for the workflow and for people who are going to get democratized by the AI with the LPU inference engine? What do you envision that's going to be enabled for them to unlock value? So it's going to eliminate a lot of drudgery. You're not going to be doing large templated work. You're not going to be doing any of that. There's some fear, is AI going to come and take my job? The reality is AI is not going to take your job. People who know how to use AI, if you don't, will take your job. Preach, louder for the people in the back on that one, yeah. But the beautiful thing about this is it can teach you. I'm actually learning things about AI from these large language models. They're great at analogies and you can pick your favorite analogy. You could be like, hey, how do large language models work? Give me an analogy from sports or give me an analogy from reading or whatever you want. And it puts it in the way that you want to understand it. You can ask it questions. And I actually think that these large language models, they're going to be good for society for the following reason. Yep. It is difficult to be subtle and nuanced. It takes thought, it takes energy. These models can do that. And so when you're using these models and you're asking them questions, they're going to be like, no, 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 it's not that simple. There's this side and there's this side. And you already see them doing that. So I actually think people are going to be better at understanding the subtlety and nuance and I think we're going to be better at getting along. My gosh, what a, first of all, that's an outstanding case for AI, and, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. As long as we're building them thoughtfully, there's going to be empathy within that that yes. will create new learning and, and new ways of even thinking about how to ask questions, well, which I'm, you yeah. Know, you know what Grok stands for? Tell us. To understand deeply with intuition and empathy. There we go. Well, no one, no one. I'm shocked Elon would be playing in that game. I want to, I want to follow up a little bit here on, on the chipset side. We're talking about silicon. For good reason, a few other AI vendors in the market making chips. What makes Grok different? Well, actually, one of the interesting things is it's the architecture, right? It's, yes. It's purely the architecture. And the same reason that GPUs are better at AI than CPUs, even though they're the, using the same silicon, we're better for inference than GPUs are. Not for training, mm -hmm. just as good. Now, that is running on 14 nanometer silicon. That's ancient. That's yeah. fabbed in Malta, New York. That's in the US. We've had this around for a while. Yeah. yeah. We assemble that in uh, California and it's deployed in Washington State. So this is a fully US thing. Our next chip is going to be built in Taylor, Texas. 
Wow. What does but, that mean for you to be able to have production here and have control? Well, On-prem, essentially, it's right? Easier, it's easier when you're talking to customers. It's easier yeah. in terms of the supply chain. Just everything is easier. So the semiconductor shortage. That's exactly what I was thinking, It doesn't John. apply to us because we have a completely differentiated supply chain. So if you buy a GPU from any vendor, they all use this thing called HPM. It's a special type of memory. And there's a finite amount that's built, yeah. and then they put it on top of something called COOS or an interposer. There's mm -hmm. a finite amount of that. Mm -hmm. We don't use any of that. So we have a completely differentiated supply mm -hmm. chain. So we could actually scale to millions of chips in the next couple of years. Amazing. The conversation we have on theCUBE a lot is around Matters. cloud computing, Smart. semiconductors enablement. What's your vision on the kind of apps that are going to come down? Because we've got the inference that's going to happen at scale. Yeah. And then yeah, as small did, yeah. language models come out, there's going to be developers going to come in here. So democratization assumes some enablement. What do you envision apps looking like um, on top of this capability? Everyone is going to do the obvious, a human being does this, let's automate it. But I think this is like the hammer and we haven't yet invented the nail. The reason that you have a hammer in your house is because of nails. Mm -hmm. There are going to be a bunch of things that are possible that we haven't envisioned yet because yeah. we haven't imagined what you could do if you had a large language model available 24 seven, not just limited to speaking to one person or a small yeah. group at a time, but could speak with a large number. Mm -hmm. The applications haven't been envisioned mm -hmm. yet. They're not even in science fiction yeah. yet. Yeah, and it's going to be great. I think I know. creativity so cool. is going to be amazing. Another really question cool. I want to ask you, as the large language models have all the fanfare, we're seeing a power law of smaller specialty models come out, maybe smaller, maybe more um, cleaner, more, more acute about domain expertise. How are models going to interact? How do you see the inference taking advantage of, of alchemy between models? So we think that there's two different paths here that people are pursuing. Mm -hmm. We're neutral, we're good at both. One is build a bunch of small models that are specialized, and the other is build a couple of very large models. Now here's the thing. Counterintuitively, small models are often more expensive to run than the large ones. Very counterintuitive, right? And the reason is, there's this thing called a batch. You actually mm -hmm. have to process multiple users at the same time to be cost effective, just like keeping a factory busy, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. If you have a very specialized model, it's hard to find enough users to keep it busy, and we've seen that very often it's more expensive to run that smaller model than one big one. Actually makes a lot of sense. But the bigger ones are slow. Yeah. We showed that model, the 70 billion, to some people who've made some of these bigger models, mm -hmm. and the first response that I got was, I'm now going to go train a 300 billion parameter model. We got this from multiple uh, customers. Whew. And the first time it happened, I'm like, but we do inference. He, he said, no, 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 you don't understand. I can train a 300 billion parameter model. That's not the problem. I can't, I can't put it in production. It's too slow. Now I can. So we can do either because That's, we're really good at small yeah. batch sizes. We do pipelining more than batching to get our performance. So we max out at batch size 20. That's where we get our best performance, whereas GPUs, it's more like 4,000. So we, we can do very small model. We don't care which way it goes, but there are trade-offs either way. We're going to see both. So you get the performance and you get the enablement. That's right. On both sides. That's right. So I, who are your customers right now that you're buying from you? Is it the cloud guys? So already uh, deployed with labs, and yeah. now we're doing a bunch of benchmarking and testing with the cloud guys, with the um, banks, with um, government, and so on. But all the people who you, you would imagine would be at the front of this. And then the interesting one is all these startups who have some use cases that are not just what would a human do, but can we have mm -hmm. a large language model do it? Those are really interesting. What's a large language model mean to you size-wise? What's the, kind of scope that out for us? Well, we think of 70 as kind of small. Um, we're mostly talking to people about 180 up now and mm. uh, 300 is, is a sweet spot, and some people want to do a trillion parameter model on our hardware, because it's the only way you can get the speed out of it. So more the merrier there. Yeah, and there's a little bit of confusion on this. People think the larger models are harder to train. In a lot of ways, they're easier. They take more compute, but they're easier. There's a great paper called The Scaling Laws, and you can actually see that every token you put into a model, the larger the model, the easier it is to absorb it. And so the larger the model, the easier it is to train, it just takes longer, costs more. So you're going to see a lot of large models being thrown together by people. They're going to need more GPUs to train that, but all the inference is going to be done on LPUs. Uh, my gosh, that's exciting. Such a, such a thrilling time. I, so we, we talked a little bit about the verticals that you're touching, and, and, and I want to uh, go back to batches just for a second. Can you give us some 
real world examples of what this means for folks. I'm thinking of, say, fraud protection yeah. within seconds versus a nightly batch ran by my bank or whatever might be an example. Well, um, so nightly versus seconds, that's the difference between fraud uh, detection and fraud prevention. Exactly. So it changes the nature. Th these are not we're not talking about making something a little bit faster, we're changing the nature of it. And so, one of the, the very interesting use cases is tutoring human beings live. People do a lot of various tasks. You don't want to hand over the decision-making authority. No one trusts these models yet. They hallucinate, they make mistakes. Right. That's the reality. Yeah. But oh my gosh, do they do a lot of the most basic stuff for you, and I actually will often iterate with a model, and I'll be like, hmm, tell me, you know, what is an orthonormal basis of emotion? <laughs> that's a math concept, and that's really weird. And then it'll come up with an answer, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I start playing with it, and so it triggers the creative You're playing process. with the left-right yeah. brain there a little exactly. bit. Yeah, and I like that. And it's sort of a creative aid. So you're going to start seeing people just throw stuff at it that they would have never done all the work to figure out themselves and be like, is this an interesting thing? Does it stick? Yeah. Yes, and start working on it. It's scaling intellect. Yes. You're, you can get in to barriers to entry to do something. Reminds me of the old cloud days. You go to Amazon, put your credit card down, you're up and running, but here, well, it's thought. Steve Jobs, you know, computers are the bicycle for the mind, this is the motorcycle for the mind. Ooh. Yeah, that's a great, great soundbite. And I'm ready to go for so, a ride, baby, so, that, let's so, go. So Elon might want to OEM the chip for his brain implant, because <laughs> that, that's something that people are really talking a lot about on Reddit these days. Well, congratulations on a great thing. I want to really follow in this inference, because there's a lot of software startups out there that are doing, quote, inference um, setup infrastructure. Yeah. How yeah, do you see that? What's the there. competition look like there? Are they customers of yours? Or are they more well, just they don't, picks they don't, and shovels? They don't need to compete. Um, our architecture is, is unique, but we're willing to license it and help other people along. There's a lot of things that we're not doing, like mm -hmm. automotive, uh, five and six G, mobile, yeah. and we're open. Uh, our, the software just works, we don't have kernels. So we have over 800 models compiling to our hardware, mm -hmm. and we can just change the size. So if you want to do a mobile configuration, fine. Mm -hmm. Why are you dealing with the software? That's the hard part, we figured that out. You want to build a chip, work with us. Now what we're seeing is, I think a lot of people misunderstood inference. I don't think they were there and experiencing it, and they think it's like this small thing. I, give, sit here for a second and define it out, because I do think there, there's a lot of quick, uh, people are quick to jump over that instead of so everyone understanding realized, what inference really means. Everyone yeah. realized that for training you needed a large compute cluster. Mm -hmm. Because it, otherwise it just takes too long. It takes you know, years instead of months. But also now the models have gotten so large that individual chips or even individual servers can't solve the problems quickly enough. They can't right. run. And one of the things is that hasn't even been done yet. Okay, as good as these large language models are, I want you to ask something, you know, some question when you go home and when you're playing with one. And I want you to imagine this. If a human being gave you that answer without having access to the backspace or delete key, how amazing would that answer be? These models are operating yeah. stream of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it and is they're true. This good. Yeah. And they're that now, good. Now, if you're lower latency and faster, you can iterate and it's like giving them the backspace and the quality grows. So typically when you it's reflect- It's editing itself. Another right. great analogy. You're killing the analogy game today, Jonathan. Thank you. Well, I've, I've been talking to the large language model. It's helped me quite a bit. <laughs> I, was, I was bringing it full circle. Yeah. I was teeing you up for that slam dunk. We're going to be out of business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the cube. But, but here's the, the, the rule of thumb. Yeah. If you iterate three times, it's like a generational model improvement. So if you're on GPT-3 and you iterate three times, you're on GPT-4. You iterate three times, you're on GPT-5. We don't know, uh, know if that keeps going, but it's- That's cool. You know, yeah, yeah. 9, 27, so it gets more expensive. So you do want the better model, but you can reach yeah. into the future and get a better yeah, model. Yeah. Fascinating conversation. I got to ask you for the, the, the rest of us out here in the real world who are transforming from the old compute storage networking cloud to an infrastructure, a kind of a new infrastructure, AI system that's emerging, whether it's a neural net or with LPUs, I can imagine maybe a whole transformation of infrastructure. How should companies, how should developers and entrepreneurs, the, uh, the creative class now, configure their data? How should they be thinking about taking their current, which will soon be old and antiquated, to a modern, architecture, because data obviously is key, language is data. What's your vision and, and recommendation, or view, of how people here are talking about getting more performance, yeah. but data's involved. You got to store it somewhere. Um, is there going to be a radical shift, or is it evolutionary? What's the, what's the, what's the transformation okay. journey of the practitioners out there, so wh whether they're entrepreneurs or some enterprise IT or data center? I, I, th I think a lot of people are looking at AI as if it's big data, just bigger data. 
The reality is the model that I just showed you would fit on my phone. So it's not big data, it's big compute. That's running on 576 chips. It's about the size of eight refrigerators. Mm -hmm. It's the compute. So we're moving from a data, uh, a data gravity sort of situation to a compute gravity. And as an example of that, um, uh, think of it this way. When training Llama 270 billion, the amount of GPUs that you need for that would be about three to five million dollars worth. But if I was to transfer all the data it was trained on, on my terrible cellular plan, that'd be about $40,000. <laughs> So data is not the problem. There is no data gravity, it's compute gravity. So we're, For sure. we're now starting to talk about and working with people to build compute centers rather than data centers. And the difference is you don't need a bunch of them all around. Mm -hmm. You can have a couple of them. Yeah. The yeah. demo you know, that I was showing you, that's 1,500 miles away. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. just as fast. So this, this, de this decoupling or awesome. from, from these systems, from memory, you're starting to see this compute Fabrics, yeah. is that why fabrics are, are hot right now? I, I would say so, and I would say that in trying to grapple with this, you are now free. You can yeah. put your data wherever you want, it's not a big deal, you can move it around, yeah. it's two bytes of data, 180 billion compute operations, yeah. and then two Ooh. bytes of data out. So Michael Dell started his company in a dorm room. The mini mainframe was a huge machine, smaller PC, form factor, is it going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, that's where it's going, right? That's the next analogy, which is well, smaller, faster, cheaper. I think it's going to get bigger and bigger. So the thing is... On the device side or the compute well, center? You can serve it on a cell phone just as fast as if it was actually faster because you get more compute. And since it's just a little bit of data, like text data, you can actually serve this from a couple of places in, in a continent and then service everyone on yeah. their mobile phones and so yeah. on. It's not a lot of data. So it's more economical, yep. like a factory, right? Mm -hmm to do that. Now, I do think that you are going to do some of this on the phone for when you're disconnected. Mm -hmm. But when you want the high quality answer, it's got to go back to the, the got compute it. center. Got it, Yeah. Got it. We'll be playing at the edge, but there is going to okay. be somewhere we're computing. All right, I got one last closing question for you. Everyone who watches theCUBE knows I'm a, a marketing background, sucker for swag. You actually brought some living marketing to the show. You brought a live llama. Yes that is just milling around Denver, Colorado right now. Yes. Her name is Bunny. Bunny. She's incredibly soft, you can pet her. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> and, and excellent activation. So, uh, makes sense for anyone who knows anything about AI, why you would bring a llama. That's uh, the name of the model. Exactly. So, it, 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 makes, it, it makes perfect sense there. Yeah. Fortunately, no one named one, you know, Tiger Shark or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or Grok with a CK, or something like that. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, what are you going to be bringing to supercomputing next year to highlight the trend that is in the pipeline right now being realized? Well, you're going to have to show up next year. Oh, okay. You're not going to tease us with a fun prediction? Rock with a Q. Um, <laughs> you're not going to expect it. <laughs> oh. Maybe, maybe he's going to buy Twitter for the, for the name. Wow, Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan with a cliffhanger. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wonderful to have you on theCUBE for the first time. Yeah. John, fantastic to sit here yeah. geeking out and yeah. taking notes with you. I, I know we both got much out of that, as much hopefully as you did, our fantastic audience. Thank you so much for joining us here in the Mile High City. We are at Supercomputing 2023. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for emerging technology news.